Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. My colleague Jane Fuller and I have been looking at a whole range of issues since uh, we went into lockdown close to 15, 16 months ago. In fact, now we have about 300 videos up on our website uh, covering all the same issues as we used to cover, including those relating to Europe. As some of you may know, we do a monthly meeting on Brussels issues with Graham Bishop, the last standing Europhile in London. We also do, as it were, a corrective view with Barney Reynolds, uh, a leading Eurosceptic lawyer, uh, looking at sort of global Britain. Uh, but sometimes it's interesting to look back, and we have the opportunity to do so uh, today with, uh, with two distinguished uh, European uh, experts. One, a senior civil servant in the uh, in the European um, firmament in Brussels, and the other, Dennis McShane, uh, a former U, uh, UK MP, MP for Rotherham, always strikes me as, uh, as interesting, given his views on nationalism and populism, uh, but also the Europe, Europe minister. Um, so the, fun the, the excuse for this is a book that David Harley has recently put out. David Harley was Deputy Secretary General at the European Parliament. He was also Secretary General of the, Soci uh, the Socialist Group in the European Parliament. Uh, he, he describes himself as a well-traveled, observant and seasoned European public servant, I quote. And he has recently published his diaries, a matter of record inside European politics. Uh, he finished that, I think, in April 2021. It is remains extremely relevant. Uh, it's, it's really interesting and it's a gripping read, uh, possibly because you're seeing something from a very, very different perspective. He is a committed European. Uh, I'm going to choose my words carefully. I'm very committed. He's he's drunk the Euro Kool-Aid, uh, but he was in the European uh, institutions for a long and crucial period, uh, doing things that he was the kind of guy who appeared in the back of the photographs. Uh, he's his heroes. And this is interesting to me. His heroes are not the people that would have expected. Pat Cox, for instance, uh, I'm a reasonably, reasonably well-informed observer of the European scene. I remember being terribly surprised when I discovered that Pat Cox was actually a man. Um, I always assumed that he was a woman. Uh, the other hero that, uh, that he has is somebody who was largely dismissed as a sort of German boor, uh, in the UK, and that's Martin Schultz, who was, comes across as a very much more sophisticated, very much more uh, subtle politician. On the other hand, some of the people he didn't get on so well with, Barroso, for instance, um, there, there are some very, very interesting vignettes uh, seen, as it were, not from below the salt, but from roughly where the salt is on the table. Um, on the other hand, uh, as I say, he was very committed to, to Europe uh, and very remains, I assume, extremely committed to Europe. And his views on the UK's government's, uh, shall we say, serpentine positions on European issues is quite interesting. Uh, also, like, like, um, like Dennis, I think, uh, both of them good socialists, they really fundamentally misunderstand the powers that produce nationalism, that produce populism. Uh, Dennis has recently written a little piece in which he says populism is based on the Führer principle, which is, of course, the final, final insult is to, to call anything you don't like fascist. Uh, but leaving that aside, can I ask David, first of all, you know, you are now living in London. Um, I would assume that you voted uh, to remain within the European Union. How do you see, uh, given your long experience of uh, London's uh, approach to Brussels, how do you see the, uh, the Johnson's government's relationship with Brussels? Is it possible that we can have a healthy relationship going forward, or is it always going to be as acrimonious as it seems to be at the present time? Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
thanks for your uh, kind words about about the diaries. Um, one or two of your remarks I'd like to pick up perhaps later on. And I dare say you wish to expand some of them yourself. My oh, views on the, on the Johnson government is that, yeah, it has to work. We have to make it work. We have to try and overcome the divisions in the country to make it work. But it's very much work in progress at the moment. I think we have an enormous problem as seen from the other side of the Channel and the North Sea, an enormous problem of trust. I would maintain that actually the, the atmosphere has improved. It could hardly have got much worse. It's improved since the G7 in Cornwall. And I have a little feeling that somebody has um, told Lord Frost to sort of put him back in his box a little bit and you know, not to go on wearing those Union Jack socks every time uh, he meets uh, world leaders. Um, at the Institute of Government the other day, um, in the report that they produced about making regulation work, they said taking back control is one thing, uh, but exercising the control is something else. And it would seem that perhaps the government has not yet come up with a cross-party comprehensive strategy uh, on what it's going to do now that it's got the control back. Another ob obvious sort of dimension, I think, of the question that you put, if I understood it correctly, is how does the rest of Europe look at Britain today and, and what do they see? And, and I think they are concerned that we do go back again to the lack of trust idea. But from where you operate in, in the city, it's particularly important, in my view, to make the new arrangements work and, and to improve them. City being the cornerstone of the British economy, even though there may well be divergent interests, somehow or other, we've got to go a bit further, I would maintain, than the memorandum of understanding and setting up yet another forum uh, from a very minimalist uh, perspective. So that's my first reaction to your question. Dennis, but, um, you know, I, I'm fight with you, spar with you for, for a very long time, but uh, I would assume that um, what David has been, his book is very close to your own views on, on, on how Europe has evolved and should evolve. To a certain extent, yes. Um, I come from 15 years' experience working in Switzerland and living partly in France. I come from having a Polish father who was a newly commissioned army officer in 39, wounded, and he ended up in Scotland, met, meets my Irish mother. And uh, so there's a bit of Poland there, a bit of Ireland there. These are the nations of Europe that I think have become themselves much more strongly uh, through participation in the European community, the European Union. Uh, and uh, we, we've now got a big problem with Scotland, <laughs> the nation of my birth, uh, saying, uh, look, we're not going to be told that we can't have a relationship with Europe. So that, in that sense, the issue of nationalism is, is always bubbling away somewhere. I agree with what David says. We need to make it work. I've long, long argued, you know, the title of my last book was called Brexiternity, the eternity of Brexit in front of us. There isn't a sort of end station where everybody's living happily ever after the Swiss started negotiating with the EU in 1993 and have just sort of walked out of the negotiations uh, what 20 odd years later. They'll probably start again. Yeah, so, they're on a roll at the moment. Uh, uh, well, they're certainly on a roll in, in, in football terms, thanks indeed to having a team, as far as I can see, entirely consisting of uh, Albanians, Kosovo, <laughs> Croats, Bosniaks, all countries that President Macron of France, whose team I believe lost last night, um, uh, doesn't want to enter the European Union. So he's also a nationalist in his own way. Good. Um, it, it's it, it, we read every day in the Financial Times, Peter Foster's excellent pieces, other reports, just of of problems. Um, the latest one is lorry drivers; they aren't going to be enough. Uh, there are other ones, hairdressers. For heaven's sake, I mean, not not a problem for you. Well, maybe a problem for Andrew and David, <laughs> not a problem for me. Um, but there aren't enough hairdressing apprentices because we stopped doing apprenticeships back in the 1980s. And we imported after 1990, highly qualified, skilled carpenters, hairdressers, nurses, doctors, electricians, shop fitters, computer bods, uh, who came from all over Europe with good training because we'd stopped training them ourselves. I, I said you didn't understand the, um, 
the foundations of populism. That sort of demonstrates it completely. Well, as, as, well, as you wish. Let, let, let's talk about the, the future of the UK going forward. I mean, what, what do we do? I mean, Jane, do you have a view on this? Um, I, well, I, what I think is difficult is that um, there are a lot of short-term problems, um, although actually some of them, such as, you know, queues, lorry queues at Dover are not as bad as um, uh, some of the scaremongers thought they were going to be. Um, but I think at the moment, um, we're still in a period where, where the UK, it has to be made as difficult for the UK as possible, whether it's over the northern, you know, the border and the Irish Sea, um, or even over the um, you know, tourists going to the continent. So I think we're still in a period of but, but tit for tat, um, because Brexit hurt, obviously hurt the EU. Um, and it's you know, we're coming up to an election in Germany. I mean, it, Angela Merkel, is it, you know, the, she has many achievements in her long time as prime minister, but is keeping the EU together and indeed making it seem, you know, gradually ever more successful. Is that the, her crowning achievement, which might, you know can't be lost at all costs? So that's what I see on the one hand. On the other, I really hope we're going to talk about centrifugal forces because, um, you know, Hungary is a good example of wanting to take back control Many of us would say take back control to, in order to run its country in a way that we, you know, we dislike, we disapprove of. Um, but, you know, um, there are centrifugal forces. And so there's the, at the moment, UK, short term difficulties, but I would be optimistic long term. Um, and Europe, not perhaps as united as it might be. Well, can I ask David on, on on that first one? I mean, is there any truth to the suggestion that we are be the tit, these tit for tat problems are really uh, a deliberate attempt to increase the cost of Brexit? Uh, so, or décourager les autres? I don't believe that is the case. But you won't be surprised to hear me say that. I just like to sort of interject a point about what I consider to be the exceptional nature of Britain's attitude to, to the EU. There are many perfectly rational uh, objections and criticisms that one can make about the EU operates. But I don't think that, and indeed such objections and criticisms are voiced in, um, in many of the, of the member states, but I don't think there's any other country among the 27 uh, that has put the principle of sovereignty before economic reality, as, as I see it. Um, it's a perfectly understandable uh, reason for people to have voted leave, but in practice, where does that actually leave us? This whole issue of British and particularly English exceptionalism is looked upon by the rest of Europe as frankly very weird. And if you can explain to me you know, why this is a, a normal trait of human behavior, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear it. On the tit for tat question, there are two very different sort of approaches to diplomacy and diplomatic negotiations, I fear. That the European Union's approach is very much rules-based and the British approach is more principle-based. Uh, and so we're constantly talking across each other. So I think that's, that's one reason for the, the current lack of progress. And then there, secondly, there is the most gigantic problem, as we all know, concerning Northern Ireland. Mistakes have been made, I think, on both sides. It's really important that there are no more unilateral decisions taken either in London or in Brussels. But if I was adv advising the British government at the moment, I would say, please don't only form your Northern Ireland policy uh, with reference to the DUP. The DUP is in deep trouble at the moment. The majority of voters in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the referendum. Majority of the population of Northern Ireland today, according to all polls, is in favor uh, of the, the arrangements in the protocol. So for domestic GB reasons, I fear that the, the British government is missing a trick uh, in trying to resolve some of these very real problems uh, at many different levels in Northern Ireland. What should the British government do? The British government should uh, open discussions, negotiations with business circles, with all political forces in Northern Ireland. 
if, if necessary, to review um, both the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. If the British government is serious in thinking that the European Union has not understood the Good Friday Agreement, which is considered in Brussels to be a laughable pronouncement, then let's talk about the detail rather than just the ideology. I mean, is that realistic? Also, the Americans say, don't touch the Good Friday Agreement. So everybody is saying, leave that alone, leave that alone, uh, because any reopening of that would... Oh, but, but the British government can't have it both ways. They can't say that the, that the EU uh, is betraying the Good Friday Agreement and, and um, preventing it from working, and they're not actually saying in what way it's doing that and not demonstrating any goodwill to make it work. When I say review, I don't mean change. I mean, look at how it can be implemented in the interests of all the interested parties. Jane, do you have a, a response to that? Um, well, I think um, the problem is that it's actually would be good, great for the UK of it to have a fudgy border in the Irish Sea. I mean, anything that fudges the borders between the UK and, and the continent of which the Irish public is part for this part for this purpose um, is actually a good thing because it's the future. I mean, pragmatism, fudge is going to take over. You know, the, the, the situation at the moment where you could have somebody quoted in the FD as saying it's easier to export to Indonesia than it, it is to the EU is just absurd. So, um, uh, and I'm glad that they said right at the beginning that we, we're going to have to get over this. And, you know, business interests, economic interests will will prevail, even though I also agree with him that the the UK, if you'd have just put, put the um, economics in the balance, that's all people were doing. Obviously, the UK would have voted to remain. Um, so, yeah, so fudgy, it's that fudginess which we can't get to while people are being ideological. Is the EU27 uh, capable or willing to fudge on something as important as, as its external border? I'm afraid fudge is not a word in the EU lexicon <laughs> because it's rules-based. You don't fudge an international treaty. Yes, that's called having your cake and eat it. Exactly. Yeah. But, but we're, told, uh, we're told that we can't have our cake and eat it on, for example... Well, what Boris Johnson himself wrote in the Daily Telegraph a couple of days after the referendum, he said, and I quote almost verbatim from, from memory, that, of course, following this referendum, we will stay in the customs union. We will stay in the single market. British people will have the right to travel, live, work, and settle in the European Union. No one is going to take that away from us. But... It has been taken away from us and by the man who wrote those very words. And that's slightly the difficulty, I think. Yeah. Generally, in diplomacy, when you sign a treaty, there's a pompous Latin phrase, pacta sunt servanda, which means treaties must be obeyed. You do obey them. Britain has signed 13,000 treaties since 1834. And we love imposing rules on other countries. And now we've got one that's a bit of a problem and suddenly we say, oh, it wasn't a blah, 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 blah. we're not following that, we're not applying that, we're just like Mr. Putin, he, he doesn't follow treaties, he doesn't follow laws, we can do what we like. And that is, well, I, I fear how it's seen. Right, <laughs> quite what anybody is saying. I mean, what, what Johnson and Johnson's government are saying is, look, it is proving difficult to yeah. follow the, uh, the agreement that we, we did sign, uh, we need flexibility on their side as well as flexibility on and ours. They've got, they've but got then David is saying that because we have a different perception, a, a, a principles-based rather than a rules-based uh, approach to these things, there is an inherent mm. implausibility, an, in, in, an inherent impossibility to find a, a satisfactory compromise. But I would disagree with is David. Is there a compromise possible on this, or are we just going to lurch from crisis to crisis until eventually the, the Northern Ireland packs it in and joins the Republic? Which, after all, is what quite a lot of people in Europe, in the EU, actually would like to see. No, the paradox is, that I speak from an Irish background, partly and an Irish citizen now, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, the one cake-and-eat-it part of the UK is indeed the six counties of Northern Ireland, because there they can remain fully British, 
but travel freely, have access to the single market from Northern Ireland, can export to anywhere in Europe without filling in any of these silly forms. And frankly, what the British government, I think, has done, having it was Boris Johnson who insisted on this. It wasn't the European Union that forced it upon him. I talked to Michel Barnier about it, and he said, Boris came to me and said, I need a deal, Michel. And he said, OK, I gave him a deal. But it involved, as Jane said, having the border in the Irish Sea rather than uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That was the deal that won Mr Johnson firstly the premiership, then the general election of 2019, then got the majority of votes, massive majorities of the Commons, apart from the DUP, in, in, in the two big treaties. And now he wants to Welsh on it. And they're simply saying, put in place systems you know, mechanisms, a few checks. Uh, yes, fill in forms, they're dead boring. Filling in forms is always dead boring, but that is the price we pay for giving you the deal you wanted to yeah. win a massive Tory majority. Okay, so so David, is, is that the compromise? Fill in a few forms. That suggests that, 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 that it will be a bit of a charade. We'll make it as easy as possible, but there will be something that appears to follow the letter of the agreement rather than the spirit of the agreement. No, I think both sides have to do better than that. Uh, I, I think that the, the protocol uh, and the integrity of the internal market, as Russell sees it, uh, requires you know, a very careful, uh, carefully prescribed legal framework that uh, has the commitments and respect of both sides. and. As the Italians often say, when you have a problem with the law, the solution is very often within the law itself. And there are lots of mechanisms in the protocol that would allow both sides to sit together and come up with a pragmatic solution without uh, going against the, the fundamental principles of the protocol. I'd like to go back to Jane's point about the fudge. I and mean, I agree that that, um, that is the, it seems to be the way that possibly the Prime Minister and those that advise him are approaching this issue. I just wonder sometimes, when I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, if there isn't a bit of a strategy on the part of the Prime Minister. Some might say this is you know, not something that one, a word that one often associates with him. Uh, but I think he's, he may well be applying the strategy of just making things get steadily worse until such time as there is a, a real problem with the land border. He wants to prove that the sea border doesn't work. So we look again at the land border, which is really crucial for preserving the integrity of the EU single market. And when the EU starts complaining and talking about the risk to peace, you say, well, you yeah. know, we're not proposing any infrastructure on the land border. If you have a problem with your internal market, go and sort it out. So I have a terrible feeling that there are some people advising the prime minister, looking at it in, a, in the long term, also trying to head off the possibility of the reunification of Ireland. And so the worse this situation gets, the less commitment that's shown to find solutions, the better it is to maintain that long-term strategy. Can I just ask, just ask something on the fudge? Because um, we, we talked about the fudge as being wholly a sort of UK um, motivation. Um, but what about, you know, exporters from Germany? Yep. Um, aren't they just as incentivized to be pragmatic and, and have fudge and minimize border pro problems for trade? Well, also. Go on, Dennis. Well, uh, I mean, they are selling very happily their Porsches, BMWs, Mercedes. We've always paid the price required for those cars that we like to drive, even when the pound's been massively devalued against first the D-Mark and then the Euro. We've always paid that premium. In other areas, I would welcome the arrival of some decent European sausages more widely in Europe, uh, sorry, in, in, in Britain, because right now you buy your Wolves banger and it's very difficult to get both ends meet. 
Um, and this is I the Marie Antoinette argument. I, I, I think, well, let, <laughs> let there be proper meaty sausages. So there's very little that Germany exports, I think. It's Beck's beer on sale everywhere. And they're used to it anyway, because they've always been exporting outside the EU. Uh, and so they've got the computer systems to fill in all these forms. They just don't understand why the, 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 the Brits uh, haven't. By the way, I mean, let's be quite clear that the EU has offered, if you like, a compromise. It, it's accepted the UK demand for a three-month extension yeah. period. No, but Mr. Seskovich is not running looking for a fight. I track the European press. I track European politics. I'm not traveling there as much as I would like to, for, you know, same as all of us. And actually, Brexit isn't a story in Europe. We're obsessed with yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, there was a German MEP debating in the Oxford Union the other day who said, I can't understand why the Brexit support is so angry. They're yeah. still complaining about Europe. I mean, they've won, they've left. Why aren't they happy? Okay, but that's an exaggeration. Hey, David, could you just address the, the, the point that Jane, Jane, Jane was making? About the German exports? Yeah. Yeah, about the interest, the, the, interest, the pragmatic economic interest of... Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, perhaps we're getting a little bit into semantics here. Um, if we're talking about a pragmatic solution, yes, I think everybody would like a pragmatic solution. Uh, and I think still there's, one could make the case for Northern Ireland being potentially in an exceptionally privileged position uh, with unique access to the UK market and well, the GB market and also to the EU market uh, through the, the border or non-border with the Republic of, of, of Ireland. So, yes. Uh, everybody should be wanting a, a solution and, unless you subscribe to the sort of conspiracy theory that, that I outlined ju just now. And certainly uh, businesses, companies uh, on the European mainland would like to do business uh, with Northern Ireland in the simplest possible way. Uh, that, to me, doesn't necessarily mean a fudge. A fudge for, for me is uh, sort of finding a way to, to, to get around uh, the rules and regulations. Um, a pragmatic solution is a way of accepting the rules and regulations and implementing them in, in a way that does not create additional problems. Um, yeah. what's, riding on the, what's riding on the German election in terms of the, the way that this will, will, will pan out? Um, I don't, yeah, Dennis. Well, that so, goes back to Dennis. I'll, I'll come in on that. Hang on, I very much like David's view of where Brexit stands in the hierarchy of European concerns. Uh, as far as I understand it, Brexit simply doesn't, uh, and the UK doesn't figure at all in the German election campaign. Um, where, do, where do you feel Brexit now fits within the, uh, the, the European agenda? Within the EU institutions, um, the Brexit barely figures. Within the institution that I know best, as they say, the, the European Parliament, uh, there is quite a sizable contingent of MEPs who are very pro-British and who would, who would like to kind of contribute to improving relations. And the Trade and Cooperation Agreement provides for a parliamentary partnership assembly, which is in the process of being put together uh, both in Brussels and in Westminster. And not quite sure if I should reveal this, but it's not exactly a state secret that apparently the House of Commons, or at least the Conservative Party in the government, have designated Sir Oliver Heald to be the leader of the British delegation uh, in this body. Uh, and that will be an interesting sort of process to feed in recommendations uh, to, to Lord Frost and Mr. Sekovic. And I think actually, from a wider perspective, more parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, on how the the TCA and the protocol are implemented would would be a good thing. I don't know if that is roughly. But in general, I mean, De Dennis is okay. Sorry, no. To do the view, views on Brexit, yeah, varies a lot from one country to another. Um, I think I have a small disagreement with, with with Dennis, and I'd very much like to discuss his 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 article if we have time later on. Um, I don't think. First of all, I think populism has become a sort of catch-all word. I think if you move from one country to another among the EU member states, some of them have, uh, uh, are, can be described as having populist movements, other are nationalists, but the most serious of all are autarkic, 
autarkic and authoritarian regimes. Uh, this is now the kind of buzzword, I think, coming out, out of Washington as well. This is becoming a sort of separate problem that we all have to deal with and something very close to the, to the heart and to the mind of, uh, of President Biden. Uh, I don't believe that there has been a lot of anti-EU feeling uh, in the different member states. What I, what I do, and I don't think that Brexit is going to be a major issue or an issue at all in the German election, depending a bit on who gets uh, becomes chancellor. If it's Armin Laschet, it'll be more of the same, but with less authority than Mrs. Merkel had. If it's uh, Anna-Lena Baerbock, the leader of the Greens, then we're in a new, very interesting situation. Uh, but neither of them, I think, will have a particularly helpful, from a British point of view, position on, on, on relations with, uh, with the UK. France is a different matter, and in my opinion, a very disturbing situation, despite the fact that the centre-right did well in the regional elections, as Dennis says, in, in his article, from personal contacts that I've had with the Gilets Jaunes, with the National Front under their new name, uh, there is a lot of resentment and, and popular unrest bubbling away under the surface, and who knows where that's going to end up. Hmm. I, I, I would reinforce the French point. I don't think hmm. Uh, hmm. Brexit is at all an issue, particularly in Germany, uh, at at. at at the moment, uh, Annalena Baerbeck uh, is the leader of the Greens, they're a candidate to be chancellor. If they get the most votes, then she has the automatic right to sort of name chancellor. But it'll be a coalition under all circumstances yeah. uh, in a very German way. Uh, she was an Erasmus scholar at the LSE. She, she loves England. She's just as uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Studied <laughs> LSE. I mean, my God, we trained all these bloody Europeans to be Brits, and <laughs> we're sort of not using them anymore. And uh, she's pro-American. She's very, very cagey on Russia. Um, but she, um, so I, I think she'll, you know, she, she'll be a good, steady chance if she gets it. But it'll be a very middle of the road chance. I'm much more worried about France because of the extraordinary surge in francophobia, in, in, in particularly the last months, mm. in some of our papers. I'm not yeah. going to it, but really, some of the stuff in some of the papers have been, it's been off the wall. Uh, and um, you won't lose any votes, whether you're Macron wanting to be re-elected, whether you're Xavier Bertrand wanting to come back from the centre-right, or if you're marrying the pen in defending French fishermen, in defending French interests, in bashing up on the Brits. And I would handle the French relationship very, very differently uh, mm. from that of the Prime Minister. Oddly enough, speaks good French, likes France, I think. Uh, but he's seen, you know, sending the Royal Navy warships off because of a little row with Jersey. Guernsey didn't get involved in that. That was simply a local, you know, parish pump Jersey politics to cause a bit of trouble. And we sent off the Royal Navy, we've still got, I think, 17 warships afloat, um, to do a new Trafalgar. Uh, really, really... Yeah. Uh, un, un, unhelpful. Anyway, French are out of the World Cup, uh, and that's the important. Uh, the Euro Cup, so that's the important thing at the moment. Uh, so, you, but you don't put any blame on the French for the deterioration in relations with the UK. So, what what would be the and who would be the most favourable to the UK next president? Um, Mary well, Mary. If, if, if Boris Johnson, Stanley Johnson, hasn't he become a French citizen? Maybe we can get him elected. Uh, no, I mean, there will be, um, unfortunately, all the old enmities have soared up to the surface again. It's very uneasy. Um, they're still, for example, be much more generous. We'll, we'll allow David to go into France, me to go into France, all of us to go into France without imposing... Uh, a home detention like we're doing and any French citizen coming into the UK having to buy these tests and rip off prices left over from the Matt Hancock regime. Uh, and France, you can just you can be double vaxxed, as I assume all of us have, you just show your NHS certificate and in you go. So um, they're trying to be helpful with British citizens living in France, but it's very tricky because it's all about reciprocity. Uh, and there are there are just tensions uh, there, and of course France would love uh, to get some of the success story of Britain. Love to have a bit of the city. Uh, President Macron's just opened two giant electric battery plants in northern France, where he needs boats. He'd love 
France to sort of take over the... Well, sort of let me ask David on that. Gosh. I mean, the city, uh, th there is a sense that, um, that Macron in particular is trying to win business for uh, Paris Europlus, um, that he does see this as, uh, this as an opportunity to build up a much, much, much bigger financial center. I mean, I realize there's problems with Amsterdam and Berlin and so on and so forth, but Macron has been taking a fairly aggressive line, particularly on issues like clearing and settlement. I mean, is this, uh, is this going to change or is this something that we will have to, to face over, um, over a number of years and who's going to win? Well, that's a, a very, very big question, which you're undoubtedly more qualified than I am to answer in a sort of way, but uh, I'm, I'm here to answer questions, so I take it on board. Uh, I think it's serious on, on Macron's part and on the part of the current French government. Um, to some extent, I would sort of, this may be a hostage to fortune, but I'm right off Mrs. Mrs. Le Pen on this particular issue. I didn't think she would really have the the savvy, the expertise uh, to promote a, a policy to um, import financial services uh, from London to uh, to Paris, um, whereas Macron has some good people around him. Um, the if it were to be a resurgence of the traditional centre right, which following Sunday sounds you know pretty plausible. I would think, and this is also an answer to, to Jane's question, who would be the most uh, friendly or favourable to the UK? I think the natural allies of a British Conservative government would be the people on the, on the centre-right and who would also be business friendly and less ideological uh, also than Macron, who is, is a bit Napoleonic. You know, that's a cheap shot that uh, you know, he, he likes to show that he is making the running, taking the lead, leading France into a glorious new future, which to some extent resembles what our own Prime Minister occasionally says. It's sort of French boosterism comes uh, easily from Macron's mouth. But I think it's a, it's a serious proposition that, and, and strategy that they have. I wouldn't have thought that they're going to be particularly successful. I think that the City of London can well look after itself. We have to hope that it's a fair fight. Uh, and I don't know if you heard or read about Mairead McGuinness um, uh, appearance before the Irish Senate, I think it was last week, uh, a little bit longer than the best two or two or three weeks ago, going on and on about trust and that, it, that the future relationship between the EU and the UK on financial services will be determined largely by the prevailing overall political climate. So that's what we have to sort out first. And to some extent, everything else will flow from that. But. Uh, I don't think the city of London need to be too worried about French attempts to um, to take over certain sectors of the city's business, uh, but let's hope at least it'll be a fair competition. Dennis? Uh, just a tiny word of warning. The one really big fight I had on French radio, so three, about three, four years ago, when there was a huge, remember the Calais jungle, all that, that problem mm. with so many um, migrants and asylum seekers? Yeah pitching up in Calais, how to sort it all out and causing a lot of trouble. Um, and and uh, I was defending the British government position. I mean, it must have been a conservative position because, you know, they've been in power for the last 10 years. I thought that <laughs> they, had a, they had a perfectly good set of points. But Bertrand was really, really denouncing me, denouncing Britain, because that's his voter base. I mean, he's yeah. right up there. He's the, of all the potential presidential replacements of Macron in the centre. Okay. Yeah. He's the one who has the most interface with the UK. I don't think he speaks English, um, but uh, it's just, you know, we don't have political contacts anymore. We don't have great diplomatic contacts anymore. Um, we, you know, very scratchy about uh, British people living in France and some French people living in Britain, uh, uh, all the old things that just made it all a bit hunky-dory. I mean, the yeah, French, yeah. French people love coming here to learn English. Mm. Uh, they really admired our universities. I mean, they, they mm. probably abused the Erasmus scheme, uh, but we sent back lots and lots of people who speak good English like England. Uh, I don't know how many of the present cabinet speak French. Um. <laughs> Well, as you say, Boris Johnson does. Can I go back to, to your diaries? I mean, uh -huh. um, 
the, the diaries stop in, in 2010, which mm -hmm. I guess is the period at which the, the, the role of the parliament started to increase in, in the trialogue and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The parliament is now a much more effective, much more powerful body than it was yeah. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, looking at the parliament now, do you see that, I mean, the committee system there is, is you know, these, these are very, I mean, we when we were, in the European Union, people like Sharon Bowles' case sure. yeah. had a big role to play, uh, particularly in financial services. Are there people in the parliament now who, if you like, could use their power, um, as it were, benignly because they understand financial services, or is it very much polarised on um, you know, left-right or nationalist? I can't or won't give you any, any names at the moment, um, but I'm sure that you could find people who would be prepared to listen and, and, and to be helpful. Um, it's true that the com committees in the European Parliament remain very influential. Uh, the Commission uh, forever has a wary eye on the committees in the Parliament, and the Parliament has a record of, um, as they would say, improving uh, regulation coming up from, from the Commission. So I think it's an area that um, representatives of the City of London uh, in Brussels would be um, well advised to to take account of and to, to make contact with. Um, what is the sense in the Parliament of uh, the, the longer term relationship with the UK, not just in financial services, when sometimes gets the feeling that the Parliament takes, as it were, more radical positions than the Commission? Well, the, I would say there are, there are two different strands generalising wildly. First of all, as I, as I mentioned just now, there is a sizable contingent. There's a sort of, I think it's called a, a EPUK friendship group. Uh, and there are a surprising number, particularly of younger MEPs from all the member states who have sort of great ties of affection with, with the UK. And a, a bit like Dennis was saying with uh, Ursula von der Leyen and, and uh, and Elena Baerbeck, the people who have you know, spent years as, as students in, in London, and those cultural ties are actually very important. In fact, that, you know, that's another area which we, which we haven't mentioned, where the UK has enormous sort of PR capital in terms of arts, music, and also where we can touch young people. If only, you know, Elton John has got very worked up about this over the last 48 hours, be very rude about the government um, restraining and restricting the movement of musicians. And that would be such an easy hit. Yeah. Uh, but, to come, but to come back uh, to um, feelings in the European Parliament, so there's that group, but then there's another group that uh, are absolutely exasperated. Um, and you know, it's been going on and on, particularly Bert Lange, who's the chair of the Trade Committee, German Socialist. I mean, <laughs> seems to take it all very much to heart. Uh, and um, we need to win these people round as well uh, if, if we're going to hope to get some sensible, mutually advantageous legislative decisions out of the European Parliament. Dennis, you're smiling. Well, <laughs> you know, simply because you mentioned Bernd Lang, Lange, he's an old friend. Um, yeah. I was listening to him literally before we started our fascinating conversation. I wish he could have taken part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, he was in a discussion with Dombrovskis, the head of trade and American representatives about EU trade policy. Yeah. And the one thing we have to be very sensitive on is to watch out now with all the money being pumped into the different Western economies that we don't start allowing unfair subsidies to distort trade. Yeah. Now, that's protectionism. And he was talking about America. He didn't mention Britain at all, but of course, mm -hmm. You know, that is one of the claims quite reasonably made by the government that it can now start to borrow and spend and subsidize, and bring back industry and manufacturing to the north of the Midlands and bring in free ports and all the rest of it. I mean, yeah. I'm not against any of this, but uh, it, it may get tricky yeah. Yeah. Uh, with um, in terms of trade with the European Union with, with guys like that. That's all. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, you, do you have thoughts on this? I and mean, we were coming to the end, but your final th thoughts on the, on the book? I mean, on uh, David's David's uh, 
uh, David's diaries and what, what they say about uh, our relationship with, with Europe? Well, they're very, very interesting. I mean, I find them fascinating, but I'm an anorak on a lot of that, and I've taken out extracts and sent them to different friends, ministers, and so on in Europe. Uh, but we were in permanent dialogue, permanent engagement of, of all parties pretty much. Uh, now, we've lost that. We're getting into refighting. The Brexit war is over. Putting it back together again, it won't be a friendship group, frankly, between Sir Oliver Heald and somebody in the European Parliament. It's got to be organic. It's got to be yeah. based on new political parties. Uh, uh, and it's got to be continuing. And it, we also need, I think, much, probably slightly better reporting, frankly, than we've got. But I don't, don't know what you can do about it. About that. So uh, it's just going to just take a long time to settle down. Um, a long, long time to settle down. I mean, much, much longer than, you know, the term of one parliament, the term of one prime minister. This is, you know, you'll probably see, you know, me out. You're a very young man, Andrew, so are you, David. So, you know, it may all get nice and sweet before you go off to the great Eurozone in the sky. Jane, Jane, there was a crack there about journalism. There was a crack there about uh, press coverage of Europe. Um, how do you see it? I mean, press coverage, I, I've always thought, was extremely favourable on the whole, uh, absent the Daily Mail and the Sun. Well, well, I think that what you have to remember, and as I said earlier on, um, we're in an interim period. So actually what journalists will do at the moment is they'll cover their bets, so there will not be consistency. So you're going to get um, uh, some of the sort of um, cross-channel spats played up because um, it's sort of fun and dramatic, um, and you're going to get any troubles uh, with goods crossing the borders played up. You're going to get any threats to the Good Friday Agreement played up. So, you know, but on the other hand, you, you also see, you know, Biden's good news, perhaps, you know, urging us all to get together. Um, much smaller headline, but the GDPR, um, the acceptance of the yeah. uh, UK's yeah. privacy, I thought was very good news the other day. So so, under, so at this stage, underneath, you know, you've got the sort of boring, the positive stories, step-by-step -step improvements are sort of boring, and the sort of, um, you know, fireworks are obviously not. Um, I'm actually a bit more worried about something that David's referred to a couple of times, which is that, um, it, it, in a way, this is one of the reasons for, for Brexit, which is that the EU's rules-based approach and the EU's, uh, the UK's more principles or outcomes based. Because actually I'm more worried about um, the continuing spats being about um, regulatory divergence. And I actually think there is no, no chance at all that the UK will have a race to the bottom. Um, a, a big consultation I've been working on to do with corporate governance and audit Actually, it, you could call it the gold plate, you know, 232 pages of gold plating of everything. So, you know, in principle, the UK will not be a race to the bottom, but there will always be um, different rules, divergences that can be played on. And so you're back, you're back to the politics, basically. Um, and <clears throat> I've actually been quite I think, encouraged, really, by actually what David said right at the beginning. Well, it has to work, mm. you know, which... Um, you know, so I do feel that there will be some momentum, but there's. <coughs> I don't think the transition period is going to last. I, I hope um, it's going to last quite as long as Dennis fears, but uh, you know. But is there any hope of bringing the principles, <coughs> rules-based systems, closer together, or will they inevitably diverge over time further and further away? They should inevitably dovetail, but it's the ammunition they can give for it. So you, yeah. you know, there is no a priori. Um, answer to that. I just I think back to, to 1979, yeah. a very famous European Court of Justice ruling about uh, it, it threatened, it destroyed the 700 year old German Reinheitsgebot. That was the beer purity. You could only make beer out of hops, water, and water. I'm not a beer expert. And the Germans fought it tooth and nail and said, you can't destroy our beer uh, and have all your fizzy, stupid lagers imported in with uh, bits of chemicals in it. And Mrs. Thatcher said, no, anything made anywhere in Europe must be sold anywhere in Europe, and we need an Iron-clad law yeah. to insist on that. So it wasn't about politics versus rules. Absolutely, she was, she was the rules girl. She yeah. was the iron lady for European law to mm. open up those markets. And if we run away from that, as the Europeans are getting closer to it, 
Well, perhaps they'll start putting up statues to Mrs. Thatcher before too long. Who knows? David, your, your view on that? I completely, I completely agree. And as we're, as we're coming to the end, um, I would like to say two things slightly portentously with, with your permission. First of all, Europe and indeed the world, and particularly the Western world and liberal democracy, uh, is going through a very critical period at the moment. And we haven't had time to talk about the United States. Um, the United States is a deeply divided country and a long way from being that shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan talked about. And when we have these problems of however you call it, be it populism, nationalism, uh, racism, Islamophobia in different countries around the continent of Europe, we see all these movements and far right and intolerance sometimes, you know, becoming more influential than, than, than one would like, then it's a pity if Britain has to stand on the sidelines when we have all these challenges in our continent. And this, the second concluding remark I'd make is, I fear that without a fundamental change of attitude from the current British government, we're in for a very long haul. On that deeply pessimistic note, can I thank Dennis McShane and David Harley and my colleague Jane Fuller, and of course, all of you for watching. Many thanks. <laughs>